In this video, I'm going to show you how you can get free historical Forex data down to the tick level, courtesy of Dukascopy, which is a Swiss bank providing Forex and CFD trading services. Now, the simplest way to access this data is to simply Google Dukascopy historical data, and you'll end up on their web portal, which looks like this. And from here, you can select a pair that you want. So I'll select the Aussie dollar, then go ahead and select a time frame. So I'll select one tick here, but you can also have one day, one week, one month, if that kind of granularity is good enough for you and your trading strategies. Now, tick data being the largest of those time frames in terms of the volume of data, the web portal only allows you to download one day's worth of data at a time. So if I select the 6th of March, I select that I want everything to be in GMT. So I want all the timestamps in the CSV that we download to be in UTC time. I can also select the units here to be in thousands or just single units. From there, we just click download. It'll ask you to sign in at this point, but it's completely free to make an account. You don't have to pay for anything or use a credit card. You just give them an email and a password, and that'll give you a free account that you can use to download this data. Now that's great and all, and that might be enough for some of you in terms of the volume of data that you need. Maybe you only need a week's worth of tick data. You can download that from the web portal, no problem. But if you need serious volumes of data, we want to do that programmatically. I haven't found a good Python project for doing this, but there is an excellent program written in TypeScript called Dukascopy Node that will do the job perfectly for us. In order to use the program, you'll need to have NPM installed on your machine or some method of installing JavaScript packages. You can test whether you have it installed by pulling up a terminal and typing NPM. If nothing happens or if you get an error, then obviously you don't have it installed. In terms of how to go about installing it, on Mac and Linux, I would recommend the Node Version Manager or NVM. All you have to do is run this single command and that will install the Node Version Manager, which then allows you to install lots of different versions of Node.js if you needed different versions for different projects. If you're on Windows, there's also NVM Windows, which is a separate project that provides very similar functionality in terms of being able to install different versions of Node.js on your system and therefore to be able to access NPM. And if you're having trouble with NVM or NVM Windows, you can instead use just plain old Node.js, go to the Node.js website, download the installer from here. I'll leave a link to a bunch of different tutorials in the description. If you get stuck on this part, you can just find the right one for your operating system. From there, we'll want to grab the command to install Dukascopy node onto our system. So you can just grab this from the Dukascopy node GitHub. Then we'll want to make sure that we're using the correct version of node. If you're using NVM, we can do that by checking nvm install dash dash LTS. If you're on Windows, I believe you don't need the double dash here. It's just LTS and then nvm use dash dash LTS. Again, the same caveat applies on Windows. So we're using the correct version of Node, just the long term support version, meaning the most stable. At that point, we just copy and paste that command to install Dukas copy Node. I already have it installed, so it ran quite quickly there. And at this point, we're fully set up and ready to start downloading some data. Now, the command you use to do that is npx dukascopy node. And then there are a few different flags we'll want to use in order to configure the exact data we want to download. You can find a list of those flags by doing dash dash help. It looks a bit cramped, so I'll maximize the screen. And we can see all these different options. So we can select the instrument we want to download, the dates from the date to the time frame. So we want one tick or one second, one minute. What time zone do we want it to be in? So what UTC offset do we want? Do we want to show the volume? There's lots of different flags you can try. I'll go through the ones that I found the most useful personally. So same as before, we want NPX Dukascopy node. 
then let's start by selecting our instrument. So I'm going to pick the euro versus the dollar. So dash I euro USD. Now we'll want to specify the date range that we want to use. And that looks like this. So we specify the date using the dash from and the dash to flags using year, month, day format. I've used a backslash to make this continue on a new line. This may or may not work depending on your operating system. I'm just using it so everything's formatted nicely. You can just enter all the commands I'm using here on one long line and it'll work perfectly. I just don't want the words to get cut off at the end of the screen. Next, we'll want to select the time frame, so dash dash time frame. Do take note that some of these involve a single dash and some of them a double dash. The single dash version is for the shortened version of the command and the double dash is for the longer version. I generally prefer to use the longer version because it's more clear what the parameter represents. So dash dash time frame and then tick. But as we saw before, you could do something like M1 or S1 to get different open, high, low, close bars. I'm also going to set the volumes parameter. So dash dash volumes. What that will do is that will make sure that the bid and ask volume appears in our CSV when we download it. By default, it's set to false. You may also want to set the volume units. As we saw on the web portal, you can set that to millions or thousands or units. Let's set it to thousands. We should also specify the format that we want to retrieve the data in. To do that, just dash dash format and then CSV. A couple other parameters that you may want to consider if you're downloading lots and lots of data in one command in one session are the batch size and the batch pause commands. So batch size represents the amount of concurrent downloads it's going to attempt. So how many different files is it going to attempt to download from Dukascopy at the same time? If you're going to be downloading a large amount of data, I would set this to as low as you can bear. By default, it's set to 10, so maybe we could set this to 5. For my use case in this tutorial, I'm only downloading 10 days of data, so I can leave that at 10. And then the batch pause parameter sets the amount of time that the program will sit idle between each batch. Again, if you're downloading lots of data, maybe set this to a higher value. So let's say 10 seconds. And this will reduce the chance that we get rate limited or the download fails. We can also specify the number of retries. So I can specify five retries and that will attempt to re-download the file if it fails for some reason. Those are all the important things to bear in mind if you're downloading tick data. So let's give that a run. As you can see, we get a nice printout showing us how long it's going to take roughly via this progress bar and some of the different parameters that we've included. So the time range, the pair, as well as things like the UTC offset. So I'll rejoin you once this downloads. Looks like it's downloaded. Let's go have a look at the file. We can see it's quite hefty at 54 megabytes and it will by default download to the download folder inside whichever folder you ran the program. So I ran the program in my home directory and the file has been downloaded to the download folder inside my home directory. Let's try and open this in LibreOffice and see how it reacts. The timestamp that it gives you will have your desired UTC offset. So by default, it's zero. So this timestamp will be UTC measured in milliseconds. We've got the ask and the bid, as well as the ask volume and the bid volume. So all the data which we might want or need. One final thing I would recommend doing when using this data source is checking that there aren't any gaps in the data. This is after all a free data source. And so it's well worth doing a double check on things like this. So let's open a Jupyter notebook and we can do a bit of preliminary data analysis with this data. First thing to do naturally is to import pandas as PD. And then from there, I can read this file in as a CSV. So we just pass in the full path to the CSV file to pandas.read underscore CSV. 
we convert the timestamp into a human readable date time using pd.2 underscore date time, remembering to specify the units are in milliseconds. And then we'll sort everything in ascending order by the timestamp as we want to make sure these are all in order. One method that you can use to look for gaps in the data now is to define a new column. Let's call it diff and I'll set diff equal to df.timestamp.diff and then I'll sort this whole data frame by diff. So what this allows us to do is to check if there are any anomalous gaps in the data, but we might want to try re-downloading that portion of the data and seeing if there's been some failure of some kind. Now this looks reasonably normal to me. We have this two day gap here, that's for the weekend. We can see that this starts at the beginning of the Sydney session, so 10 p.m. UTC on the 1st of the 8th of January of this year, which is indeed a Sunday. So that explains this two day gap. There is a gap of 25 minutes there and four minutes and 30 there. So you may want to look into that, but it's also during the Sydney session where we don't expect to see massive volume anyway. So I hope this video has been helpful for you and I'll see you in the next one.